from Pacifica Radio, this is Democracy Now! The U.S. is thinking the unthinkable. It's preparing for the possible use of nuclear weapons against Iraq. We'll talk to military analyst William Arkin. Then we'll look at the weapon the Pentagon already uses but often refuses to admit, depleted uranium. Any future use of this substance would cause not only biological and human but also ecological catastrophe in any place where it is used. We'll speak with the military doctor who first tested Gulf War vets for radiation exposure. But first to Baghdad to talk with Hans von Sponeck about a new report on the health effects of war. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Facing its most chronic shortage in oil in quarter of a century, the U.S. this month is turning to an unlikely source of help, Iraq. That's right, Iraq. As Iraq prepares for a U.S. invasion, it has doubled its exports of oil to U.S. companies, including Chevron, Exxon, British Petroleum and Shell. This according to a report in the London Observer. The U.S. is facing an oil crisis after exports from Venezuela dried up due to the ongoing management lockout. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that attorneys in the State Department and Pentagon have been studying international law to put forward a legal case to allow the U.S. military to take full control of Iraqi oil fields in the case of war. For the first time, the Pentagon publicly confirmed yesterday U.S. Special Forces are already inside Iraq preparing for war. Meanwhile, members of the Iraqi opposition are reporting three U.S. military cargo planes landed yesterday in northeastern Iraq. The prime ministers of eight European countries, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Britain, Hungary, Poland, Denmark, and Czechoslovakia, have signed an open letter to the international community backing the Bush administration's stance on Iraq. In Baghdad today, the Center for Economic and Social Rights released a major report highlighting the human costs of war against Iraq. The report warns the U.S. military forces may commit war crimes by deliberately destroying essential civil life support systems. More on that story in a few minutes. Hours before President Bush delivered his State of the Union address Tuesday night, the White House held a sneak preview to a select audience of Republican lobbyists and executives, including pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly, AT&T, and Pat Buchanan's group, American Cause. The New York Times is reporting the Pentagon may enlist the nation's major airlines in preparing for war against Iraq by reactivating what's known as the civil, Civilian Reserve Air Fleet. Airlines who take part include Delta, Northwest, American, Continental, United, and U.S. Airways. Cargo carriers include Federal, Express, DHL, and UPS. It can be a lucrative business. During the Gulf War, the Pentagon gave the carriers $1.5 billion to carry troops and equipment to the Gulf. The White House announced yesterday it's canceled a poetry symposium because it feared some poets may read anti-war poems. First Lady Laura Bush was to host the event. Her spokesperson said, quote, While Mrs. Bush respects the right of all Americans to express their opinions, she too has opinions and believes it would be inappropriate to turn a literary event into a political forum. And the nation's largest cable company, Comcast, is refusing to air a 30-second ad taken out by the anti-war group Peace Action Education Fund. The group had purchased airtime on CNN to coincide with Bush's State of the Union address, but Comcast pulled the ads, charging the ads were unsubstanti- made unsubstantiated claims. After the annual meeting of the American Historical Association earlier this month, U.S. historians formed a new national network called Historians Against the War. So far, more than 1,000 historians from 250 colleges and universities have joined in. 
The Bush administration is determined Indonesian soldiers murdered three teachers, including two Americans, last August. The attack occurred while the teachers were returning from a picnic in West Papua. The New York Times reported the military may have been trying to send a message to the U.S. company Freeport McMoran Copper and Gold, which operates one of the world's largest copper and gold mining operations there in the world. The company for which the teachers taught had recently reduced its payments to area soldiers. The Indonesian military had accused rebels of the murders. This news comes as the Bush administration tries to restore military ties to Indonesia. In Boston, 70 lawsuits were filed yesterday against 41 Catholic priests charging sexual abuse. It brings the total number of lawsuits against the archdiocese to 470. The world's largest media corporation, AOL Time Warner, yesterday posted the biggest annual loss in U.S. history, almost $100 billion. In Columbus, Georgia, a federal magistrate has sentenced 42 protesters to up to six months in prison for demonstrating at the School of the Americas at Fort Benning. And anti-war protests are continuing throughout the world. But before we go to those, we are going to go to Baghdad, where the Center for Economic and Social Rights has released a major report highlighting the human costs of a war against Iraq. The report warning U.S. military forces may commit war crimes by deliberately destroying essential civilian life support systems. Hans von Sponek is on the line with us, the former humanitarian coordinator in Iraq, who resigned his position three years ago to protest the international policy toward Iraq, including sanctions. He's in Baghdad as a special envoy to the Center for Economic and Social Rights. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Hans von Sponek. Good uh, morning to you, uh, Amy. It's good to have you with us. Can you just very briefly, we will go into this more extensively in the coming days, um, tell us the findings um, of your report and trip. Well, um, you know, this is a multi-pronged um, approach here. Um, and uh, the research team uh, represents one component. And uh, the picture that they painted to uh, both Iraqi as well as uh, foreign journalists uh, was one uh, of the fragility of the uh, existing um, infrastructure, uh, the distribution infrastructure, the health infrastructure, um, wouldn't uh, withstand uh, and the, uh, the, the pressures that a war would bring. And uh, they outlined what would happen in terms of uh, water supply, electricity, uh, the food distribution, which at the moment under the Oil for Food program works adequately well um, would very quickly um, disappear and uh, endanger the physical survival of uh, at least uh, 10 million, uh, if not more, Iraqis. Uh, this figure is, by the way, also a figure that is used uh, by the United Nations in their confidential contingency planning reports. Uh, one in your group, um, uh, Professor Ron Waldman uh, from Columbia University School of Public Health, has been saying in some ways Iraq has become like a vast refugee camp. The population survives largely on food rations and, um, and depends on a fragile public health system that's extremely vulnerable. Can you elaborate? Well, um, I think um, this uh, applies... Um, for many years now under a sanction regime which has all the limitations uh, that one would have as a refugee in a camp. Uh, no normal education system and no employment uh, in a refugee camp. People don't work um, in Iraq. Uh, also people don't work. At least many are out of work. 60 to 70 percent is the estimate. Um, so it has all the uh, characteristics of an unnatural life um, of the kind that one needs um, if one is confined to a refugee camp. Well, as uh, the team members uh, from the Center for Economic and Social Ret Rights return back to the United States, we'll look more extensively at the findings. Hans von Sponek, thank you very much for joining us from Iraq. And as I said, anti-war protests continuing around the world. In Washington, thousands gathered Tuesday in front of the Capitol um, for the sorry State of the Union rally and concert. In Madison, Wisconsin, nearly 2,000 packed a local theater for an anti-war gathering yesterday 
in Grand Rapids, Michigan. About 1,000 people brave the cold and snowy weather for several hours to protest a visit by President Bush. And at Shannon Airport in Ireland, 50-year-old peace activist Mary Kelly was arrested for attacking a U.S. Navy plane with a hammer. She caused over a half a million dollars in damage and forced the plane to be grounded. It was headed to the Middle East. For our break, we go to the sounds of a protest in Colorado outside the offices of military contractor Halliburton. Halliburton being the largest oil services corporation in the world, formerly headed by now Vice President Dick Cheney. 300 people marched there on Monday to protest against war. 21 were arrested. This was recorded by Brian Cousins of KGNU. You are listening to Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Military analyst William Arkin is reporting in the Los Angeles Times, quote, One year after President Bush labeled Iraq, Iran, and North Korea the axis of evil, the United States is thinking of the unthinkable. It's preparing for the possible use of nuclear weapons against Iraq. At the U.S. Strategic Command, STRATCOM in Omaha, and inside planning cells at the Joint Chiefs of Staff, target lists are being scrutinized, options are being pondered, and procedures are being tested to give nuclear armaments a role in the new U.S. doctrine of preemption. Arkin reports the Bush administration has significantly lowered the nuclear threshold to make so-called preemptive nuclear attacks a possibility. This may also lead to other nations revising their own thresholds that dictate when nuclear weapons are deployed. Arkin concludes that to use nuclear weapons to defeat Iraqi President Saddam Hussein has the potential to create a political and global disaster. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Bill Arkin. Thank you very much. Can you go into um, first uh, how you know about these plans and then um, what uh, you see as the issues with them? Well, I think there's two things that are going on that sort of gave me some insights into this. I have been covering the nuclear issue for quite some time and revealed the nuclear posture review last March in the L.A. Times, and so it was a beat that I was very close to. It seems like there is both an enormous amount of activity at the national level to uh, redefine and rewrite the plans for the use of nuclear weapons by the Bush administration post-September 11th, and then I think at the same time there's concern inside the unifi uniform military that the efforts to do so and to make nuclear weapons more relevant and, and, and to place them in the center of any kind of a war on terrorism is alarming to people in the uniformed military and, and they have definitely expressed their concern that these types of moves are going forward. So I, I started to hear both inklings of this from inside from people inside the armed forces, but also had seen that there was a tremendous amount of effort going on to uh, make nuclear weapons more relevant in the overall war on terrorism. You uh, lay out uh, your concerns about the U.S. Uh, lowering the nuclear threshold. Uh, can you talk about that? Well, it's important that most people understand that, that what's happening here is a significant departure from even Cold War nuclear policy. I think when we think of nuclear weapons, whether we like them or not, I guess one could conclude that there's a consensus that says that nuclear weapons are only to be used under conditions of national survival or in retaliation to the use of nuclear weapons. And that threat of retaliation is what we call deterrence. And really for 50 years, that policy more or less remained the same and became more and more refined as nuclear weapons themselves became more and more marginalized with the end of the Cold War. The departure here is twofold. One, the contemplation of the use of nuclear weapons 
not in retaliation to enemy use of nuclear weapons, but in anticipation of the use of not just nuclear weapons, but chemical and biological weapons as well. And two, the preemptive use of these weapons, which is to say that the Bush administration's policy, as was codified in a presidential directive last May, is that the United States could reserve the right, well, did reserve the right to use nuclear weapons and therefore could use nuclear weapons if it thought that a nation or a terrorist organization was preparing to use even chemical or biological weapons that nuclear weapons could be used in a first strike. It seems to me that this departure, that is raising the level of the possibility of the use of nuclear weapons, sort of has two effects. I mean, one is... And, and, and maybe your listeners aren't so concerned about this, but it's a terrible misreading of this military situation and an insult to the U.S. military. I think, if anything, the U.S. military has proven to be one of the most competent elements of the American government and certainly has proven since 1991 in the Gulf War that the conventional forces available at the U.S. Dis disposal make nuclear weapons more and more marginal and less and less important. And this is part of the Rumsfeld-Bush tension with the U.S. military, which I think we've seen since the beginning of the administration. Second, it really signals to the rest of the world a completely uh, contrary and counterproductive uh, policy stance on the part of the United States, which is to say that it says to the Indias, to the Pakistans, and others that the use of nuclear weapons for purely military purposes, that is to physically destroy a deep underground bunker or destroy a biological weapons facility, is justified. And that nuclear weapons, in fact, are not just weapons that are for national survival and deterrence. They're actually military instruments to be used on the battlefield. And for the United States even to communicate that possibility and communicate that policy around the world exactly undermines our goals, which is to eradicate weapons of mass destruction because it elevates the importance of those weapons in a physical military sense. William Mark, and you write in trusting major policy reviews to tightly controlled secret organizations inside the Pentagon is a hallmark of Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld's tenure. And you talk about um, your concern about uh, bypassing dissenters. Well, I think that there's sort of two things that are going on right now, and we saw that, I think, in spades in the President's State of the Union address. These guys really believe what they believe. They believe that, uh, that there is a dire threat to the United States and that that threat includes weapons of mass destruction. And the entire development of the Department of Homeland Security, the global war on terrorism, the preparations for war in Iraq, all of these are flowing from a kind of groupthink, or at least what I think is groupthink, that says that not only is there this dire threat, but that somehow it threatens the very survival of America, both of which I think are wrong. It's not to say that there isn't a terrorist threat. I just think it needs to be put into proportion. And so if you, if you start from the standpoint of understanding kind of the psychology of the Bush administration, then you also understand how it is that they have created a very tight inner circle of decision makers who are sitting on top of intelligence information and are pulling the strings behind a covert war against terrorism that uh, has more and more created ad hoc organizations and ad hoc decision making structures structures that that circumvent the conventional military and the conventional way of doing things and and not only has this created a tremendous amount of tension with the american military but it is essentially put in the hands of the president uh... the tools including i'm afraid to say nuclear weapons uh, that could be employed with little more than the kind of uh, uh, deliberations of a group of people who already are in agreement that the that the survival of the United States and the West is it is is at hand. In which case, then the debate about the use of these weapons would be truncated and would it, or would not exist at all. And you say this is going on at Stratcom's Omaha headquarters, Strategic Command, uh, among small teams in Washington, and at Vice President Dick Cheney's undisclosed location in Pennsylvania. That's correct. Um, you know, it's funny that. Uh, his undisclosed location in Pennsylvania is in itself an example of these secret organizations. Look, we know where President 
Vice President Cheney goes when he goes to his underground bunker. Where does he uh, go? He goes to a place called Raven Rock, which is uh, uh, also known as Site R. And it's it's obvious, it's well known, and yet it can't be reported in the L.A. Times. This is COG, Continuity of Government? Well, I, it's part of the Continuity of Government, but it's also Site R is the, is the alternate Pentagon. It's it, It's the place where military operations would be directed from uh, if there were an attack upon the Pentagon, which is, I guess, not so silly to uh, to uh, imagine. But uh, this has been a site that's been around since the Eisenhower years, and um, it wasn't initially intended for a government uh, uh, relocation. There were a variety of other underground bunkers that were intended for that purpose during the Cold War, but those bunkers have all been closed, and everything has now been consolidated at Site R, which was initially a military facility. So, But here we are where it's obvious where the vice president goes. It's the only underground facility that the United States still operates other than Cheyenne Mountain, where the Air Defense Command is. And the and yet it can't be said and and there are other organizations and capabilities of the US government that are in a similar boat that is to say they've either been newly created since 9/11 or they have been reinvigorated and this whole sort of secret world that is that is now being created to ostensibly fight the global war on terrorism is really a severe challenge to what we consider to be the military and foreign policy options available to the government because those options and capabilities are the ones that most people see and are open to them and are the ones that they conceive of when they think of war. William Arkin, I want to thank you for being with us, military analyst. Thank you very much. Uh, whose piece uh, appeared last week in the Los Angeles Times. Uh, Arkin ends by saying, the danger is that nuclear weapons locked away in a Pandora's box for more than half a century are being taken out of that lockbox and put on the shelf with everything else. While Pentagon leaders insist that does not mean they take nuclear weapons lightly, critics fear that removing the firewall and adding nuclear weapons to the normal option ladder makes their use more likely, especially under a policy of preemption that says Washington alone will decide when to strike. To make such a doctrine encompass nuclear weapons is to embrace a view that sooner or later will spread beyond the moral capitals of Washington and London to New Delhi and Islamabad to Pyongyang and Baghdad, Beijing, Tel Aviv and to every nuclear nation of the future. If that happens, the world will have become infinitely more dangerous than it was two years ago when George W. Bush took the presidential oath of office. You're listening to Democracy Now! When we come back, we'll look at depleted uranium. Stay with us. You are listening to Democracy Now!, Breaking the Sound Barrier. I'm Amy Goodman. Sperm banks across the country are heeding the call of patriotism and offering U.S. servicemen faced with fighting a possible war in Iraq the chance to leave a little of themselves behind for free or at a deep discount. California Cryobank, one of the nation's largest sperm banks, said on Wednesday that more than 40 military personnel had taken up a one year's free sperm storage offer as a precaution against the possibly harmful effects of vaccine or chemical weapons exposure like depleted uranium on their fertility. 
Well, today we're going to talk about depleted uranium as the Pentagon weighs deploying nuclear weapons in Iraq. We're going to look at this other kind of radioactive weapon that U.S. troops may use. Depleted uranium is the most effective anti-tank weapon ever devised. It's made from nuclear waste left over from the making of nuclear weapons and fuel. As an unwanted waste product of the atomic energy industry, it's extremely cheap. It's also the densest material available on the market and can smash through all known armor. U.S. gunners say DU rounds save lives on the front line. But when DU rounds punch through enemy tanks, they create a firestorm of uranium dioxide dust. Those invisible particles are still hot. As the Christian Science Monitor's Scott Peterson writes, the particles make Geiger counters sing. They stick to the tanks, contaminate the soil, and blow in the desert wind, as they will for the four and a half billion years it takes for the DU to lose its radioactivity. The U.S. military introduced DU weapons to the world for the first time in the 91 Gulf War. U.S. gunners used 320 tons of DU to destroy 4,000 Iraqi armored vehicles. The Pentagon deemed those vehicles a, quote, substantial risk, and U.S. forces buried them in Saudi Arabia and low-level radioactive waste dumps in the U.S. Thousands of U.S. troops became sick after that war afflicted with a range of mysterious symptoms that have come to be known as Gulf War Syndrome. Many vets believe that depleted uranium is responsible. According to Reuters, some troops are so concerned about a new Gulf War Syndrome, they've begun to bank their sperm, as we said before heading to the Middle East. Iraqis say DU is a major cause of the severe health problems such as cancer and birth defects in Iraq. The director of the cancer ward at Basra's Saddam Teaching Hospital says pre-war cancer rates have increased 11 times. The Pentagon and the White House deny this. Pentagon officials refer to the latest government report on the subject, which said Gulf War exposures to depleted uranium have not to date produced any observable adverse health effects attributable to DU's chemical toxicity or low-level radiation. Just last week, the White House Office of Global Communications rolled out a new propaganda document called Apparatus of Lies, Saddam's Disinformation and Propaganda, 1990 to 2003. The document characterized Iraq's claims as a campaign of disinformation. We're going to start off um, this segment uh, by briefly talking to Steve Robinson. We did place n uh, numerous calls to the Pentagon, um, but they refused to be interviewed. Steve Robinson is executive director of the National Gulf War Resource Center, uh, which monitors the current status of scientific studies. Very briefly, uh, Steve, can you uh, just tell us how many Gulf War vets you believe have been affected by depleted uranium? Sure. Um, actually, there's a uh, we we maintain a, a lot of different numbers where we can get them. Right now, as we understand it, uh, about uh, 400,000 were exposed to depleted uranium. About 250,000 took the experimental uh, vaccinations and uh, and pills, and about 140,000 were exposed to chemical warfare agent during the war. And how do you know this? How are you doing these counts? How do we get the numbers? Yes. These numbers are estimates given by the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And how do you know that depleted uranium is playing a role? I mean, s vets um, have been exposed to so much. Well, <clears throat> we, uh, for my organization, we, we look at depleted uranium as an unanswered question. And the question is, can... Um, can DU uh, cause long-term health effects? Now, there have been many scientific studies that are starting to come out that show that in laboratory analysis, laboratory animals, DU ingested and inhaled can cause cancers. Um, we've got United Kingdom soldiers who have depleted uranium uh, in their, in their um, body serum, and those soldiers are starting to have systemic uh, problems with their different um, body organs. And we've also got the reports that are coming out of Iraq, um, which you have to uh, view with a uh, skeptical eye. But um, I don't think the question uh, is answered yet. So in my mind and for our organization, we know that uh, DU is harmful 
because we've got science that says that it is. The real big question is, is it the thing that caused Gulf War illnesses? I think it's part of it, but I think there are also other exposures along with depleted uranium that, that made veterans sick. Well, Steve Robinson, I want to thank you very much for being with us, Executive Director of the National Gulf War Resource Center. We're now going to turn to Dr. Asaf Jurakovich, who is a nuclear scientist um, and was the Chief of Nuclear Sciences Division at the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute um, at the VA hospital in Wilmington, Delaware, where he discovered the first Gulf War veterans with symptoms of radiation exposure. He's been blacklisted in the United States for exposing the depleted uranium link to Gulf War syndrome. Again, a former U.S. Army colonel. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you. It's good to have you with us. Um, can you talk about first how you got involved with this research? How it is that you first decided to test um, Gulf War veterans who are complaining uh, of being of feeling ill to test them for radiation exposure. Before I start, I would like to state that I am a Gulf veteran myself. In the month of August 1991, Ventnor Clinic of New Jersey referred to me 24 United States soldiers who suffered from symptomatology that they could not understand. I examined those patients at the nuclear medicine clinic of the VA hospital in Wilmington, and by taking patients' histories and symptoms, I concluded that they could have been contaminated internally by some radioactive isotopes. At that time, it was very well known to me that depleted uranium was detected in the tanks that were being buried in the sands of Saudi Arabia by Dr. Doug Rocky. I sent the samples of urines of those patients to Army Radiochemistry Laboratory in Aberdeen, Maryland, and they simply disappeared. For many months, we had no evidence what happened to those samples. Later on, there were several theories that they were negative, they disappeared, the post office did not deliver them, so it was total obscurity of it. I continued my work for several years, and I encountered considerable resistance from the government about continuation of my research. I was asked to stop my work, which I refused, saying that I was hired by the government of the United States to protect and heal and cure the veterans who are re uh, referred to me. So I continued my work. Can you explain why the, the can, you ex can you explain why the government uh, and the military hospital was telling you to stop? Well, management of the hospital itself, including director, including chief of staff, including several telephone calls from every conceivable, conceivable level of the government of the United States, even some of my former colleagues who worked with me on active duty in the different militaries were calling me uh, from different parts of the country asking me to stop that research, which I plainly and adamantly refused because I was hired by the government of the United States to take care of the people who were under my jurisdiction, my patients who were treated and studied in the, internal, in the nuclear medicine clinic of my hospital. And so with the hospital wanting you to stop and you refusing to do that, what happened? Yes, yes, the hospital management showed not only resistance but also opened hostility. When I organized a meeting between a military and the VA officials to study or, or to implement radioactive uh, response team in the VA hospital, it was directly and straightforwardly objected by the director of the hospital who told me that I cannot continue that work. And so at what point did you part ways? I beg your pardon? At what point did you part ways with the hospital? 
did, what point? At what point did you leave? Uh, we have unclear connection. I'm very. At what point did you leave the hospital? Were you forced out? Oh, uh, I was terminated after 18 years of honorable service in the government of the United States, including 14 years of active duty with the rank of colonel. I simply was terminated in the year uh, 1998. My job was terminated, and I was the only government nuclear medicine specialist in the state of Delaware. Therefore, my presence in that hospital was absolutely essential. As soon as I left, they hired another full-time person to replace me. I'm looking at a piece in the Sunday Times of London that appeared uh, two years ago, and it says a scientist's theory about why soldiers are ill is so contentious that the authorities want to silence him. Nine years of obsessively pursuing research that could have huge implications for Britain and America have taken their toll on Dr. Asaf Jurakovich. As he looked out over a packed auditorium, he railed against the government conspiracy that prevented his paper being highlighted as one of the best at the European Conference of Nuclear Medicine last week. Afterwards, the truculent 60-year-old tells me it's a miracle they accepted the presentation in the first place. And yet they did, and you are seen by many as one of the foremost medical doctors and scientists working internationally in the field of nuclear and radiation medicine. After you left um, the um, U.S. government and military hospitals employ, how did you continue your work and what have you found in regards to depleted uranium? And then we're going to talk about your latest um, research as well. I wrote a letter to President of the United States, Bill Clinton, stating that, in my opinion, resistance about my work in dealing with the sick Gulf War veterans constitutes nothing else but conspiracy against the veterans of the United States. I was motivated by the patriotic motives to help those unfortunate soldiers who sacrificed their health and their lives in the battlefield in the desert of Iraq. After I was terminated in the VA hospital, I decided to continue my work because many of those soldiers were dependent on me and I started with them before I was terminated in my position. The duty of the medical doctor is never to abandon his patient. It was not my intention to ever abandon the people who were entrusted to me by the government of the United States to study, diagnose, and treat them. My ethical responsibility and my patriotic responsibility to this country included my moral duty to continue that work. As all doors were closed to me in the government hospitals, I started our own institute, which is currently called Uranium Medical Research Center. We continue the work with the patients who were veterans from Great Britain, Canada, and the United States, and we analyze their samples in non-governmental labor laboratories. We found that over 60% of the patients referred to us contained depleted uranium in their bodies. This study has been published in the United States Journal of Military Medicine last year, and another study is going to be published in the month of June of the current year. The work continues not only with the remaining population of the veterans of the Allied forces, but also with the population of Afghanistan or any population that, in our opinion, is exposed to uranium and transuranic elements, because this is a field of my specialty, my medical expertise, and 30 years of intense research in the medical and biological effects of internally deposited radioactivity. If um, soldiers are getting sick uh, because of exposure to depleted uranium, um, what can they do? What do you believe is um, the treatment? Medical facilities of the entire world of today, with all sophistication that has been developed after Korean War, Vietnam War, 
and experiences in the different battlefields are not capable of dealing with the mass casualties caused by the radioactive and nuclear weapons. Radioactivity internally deposited in the bodies of the people who inhaled radioactive dust containing depleted uranium or non-depleted uranium are such that no medical facility of the world can handle more than maybe a couple of dozen patients at a time. We know from the experience of the research and the practical cases of the wars that some of the irradiated patients, either outside or inside irradiated, can be treated. But we are talking about millions of potential victims in the event of the mass use of nuclear or radioactive weapons. As a medical doctor and a scientist, I have to make a statement that medicine of today is not capable to provide the care for the mass casualties that are anticipated in the uncontrolled use of nuclear weapons. Even if the weapons are used in the limited fashion, like concentrated on the city of Baghdad or Basra, or any other city of the world, we are dealing with unforeseeable consequences which will not only affect current generations, generation, but many generations later. We have evidence in our own patients who have been studied by the spectrometry analysis that their cells contain chromosomal damage and mutations, which was done in one of the laboratories in Germany. So there is no doubt that depleted uranium present in the body of American, Canadian, and British soldiers did already cause genetic mutations that are going to follow for many generations to come. Dr. Jurakovic, we have to break for 60 seconds. I also just want to stress to our listeners and viewers, this is a very rare interview that Dr. Jurakovic uh, is doing. Uh, we also are going to talk about um, what his very preliminary findings have been um, and looking at what uh, has been used in Iraq, uh, rather in Afghanistan. And we're going to talk about that when we come back. Stay with us. <laughs> 